grab un brush. And uh, let's get to painting. I'm just going to do dark purple first and some other base colors first, and then we'll work out of that. And decide if we want to do any, because uh, we'll probably wet blend quite a bit on her skin to get going. But a good solid base coat just to kind of go in and, and get a feel for what I'm going to be doing is always a good start for me. So it's going to look funky as we do this. Looking to use the dark purple as an area for shadow. Female face not usually as pronounced as the male face can be, but usually isn't. And so you don't have the same style of shading. But I'm going to start fairly aggressive and then work out of that anyway. So my, uh, my shading under the cheeks and temple area are going to be a little bit more aggressive than they normally would be for a female just to start. You'll hear the term sketching a lot in miniature painting. That's what we're doing here. Just sketching some color on. I'll go ahead and put some, uh, let's put some camo green. Out on the palette. And some burnt red out on the palette. And some shadow flush out on the palette. You know, as we paint what we'll call like a general Caucasian flesh tone, that a lot of times these are the colors I will start with. Right now, I'm all I'm doing, I'm not really, I'm not blending anything. It will start to maybe appear that I am blending something. Because I'm just using really loose brush strokes. Right. And as I use those very loose brush strokes, I'm just grabbing, you know, and putting the green over the purple. So that's why I painted some of the purple into the area I knew I was going to do the green. I'm painting some of the green into the area I know I'm going to just want purple, blah, blah, blah. Right. Pretty easy. You're freaking out, like, what are you doing? Skin's not green and purple. Hang out. 
<laughs> hang out and watch us paint for a while. We are painting the green Wonder Woman. That's a lie. Don't believe the man. He's lying to you. We are not painting green Wonder Woman. I also got to figure out how I want the lighting on her to be, right? A bust is a great place to be able to utilize some, uh, some interesting lighting effects. You might want to uh, do something fun with her. I don't know. What do we think? She's kind of got her torso twisted off to her right, our left, and then the head cocked back to the other direction. So we could do lighting from this side. Kinda. I mean, because if we look at if we look at her body where it's like you know direct torso straight on, how did that? We got a flake of primer off there. Must not must have had a a spot of dirt that was still there. Right. If we look at her torso straight on and she's looking off to the the right, her left, right. A, a strong lighting from this side could work. If we choose to turn the the whole model to where we're looking straight on to her face, then either side works. But typically, again, I think this side because the torso is there. So that's what I'm going to go for. I kind of like the idea of her looking off in the distance as opposed to looking straight at us. This is a little more interesting. She got bad shellfish at the restaurant? Well, of course. <laughs> Oh, is Asmodai, is this, uh, is this from that link? One of our viewers printed this out for us, so I don't know where it came from. But if that's the, uh, if that's the link, there you go. She was She-Hulk all along. Who knew? Who knew there was a crossover in the working? But yeah, it's just Wonder Woman. I had no idea where it was from. He didn't ever tell me. Olive Flesh Primer. No, it's never going to happen. Only because Amazon Prime, what is going on? This is Zivon the Vomen. I keep forgetting we got to move the camera because she's a very large, large bust. I'm half tempted to like do a, a nice underpaint on her and then come back and use the airbrush to get our first layer of skin tones. Would you guys like to see that happen? Would that be of interest to see how I would do that? we could just continue to brush paint. I don't know that I have a preference right now.
<laughs> Commander Cotton Fluff. $20.50 to paint that bootay. Worth. <laughs> Worth. Is that how much this model is? The STL file? Is it $20? Is that good? I don't know. I don't work in the world of 3D printed enough to know what the, the price scaling is for stuff like this. Again, the purple is just a really, really good default kind of shadow color for flesh rather than dark brown or something like that. Because if you look at your skin, your skin has all sorts of colors in it. Greens, purples, reds, yellows, yada, yada, right? And so um, the purple gives you a much more interesting basis for your shadows than just a brown. Doesn't mean that you can't use a dark brown in the shadows, you know, but a, a good layer of purple to start on a flesh tone model. Sometimes you just can paint the whole model flesh tone and be fine. Hambone says, let's see it. Is that the only answer? So let's do the, uh, let's do the underpainting with brush and then overpaint initial layer with the airbrush. Do the glazing and then come back with the brush and finish it out. Is that too complicated? That's still something that'll hold your attention. It's actually a very good way to paint. Uh, if you have access to an airbrush by doing what I'm about to do, or if we decide to go that way, a uh, great way to do flesh, but also a great way to do armor. So I think it would be a good thing to do to kind of go through and, and show that process. You know, there's times where we do it, not very often where we do the brush work first though, right? A lot of times when we talk about overpaint, underpaint, we're doing it all with the airbrush because the airbrush gives us a really, really good way to control our opacity of each color as opposed to, you know, fighting it with the brush and worrying about, you know, oh my God, I got to glaze 15 million layers and yada, 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 right? Leave glazing as sort of a more topical solution. Does that make sense? But uh, here, we'll kind of just glaze with the airbrush if we choose to do it this way. I'm going to paint the sides of the bust where the arm should be. I'm going to do those in black kind of standard sculptor style. If you were to go to the museum, see those wings. Uh, I don't remember what they call the, the blank arms. There's a term for it. But. Beating the absolute crud out of this brush. I probably should not be using my sable for this. Matter of fact, let's put that away. And let's grab, oh, except that that's probably why I'm using the sable for, the, oh, no, here's number four. Her arms need more DACA. Should have converted her, put, like, big old guns on her shoulders, like big laze turrets. <laughs> I like your style. I like your style. Now we're talking. I wasn't ready to just butcher this model. I'm actually having fun with it.
and just honing in on these areas that uh, we know are going to be in shadow. Slop the purple around. This is our dark purple, by the way. It is a fantastic base coat color for shadows of all types. I don't know what the... This is the modern Wonder Woman. Like, this is the Gal Gadot Wonder Woman, right? So, I have no idea what her armor looks like. We're going to have to look. I feel like it was a lot of, like, burnt red, right? Like, like uh, ox blood red colored leather. Am I wrong? Metallic red and gold? How metallic are we talking? Like, we're just talking shiny red? But it's a darker red, isn't it? It's not like bright red, like Captain America red, is it? I don't know why I said Captain America. Not like metallic Iron Man red. Bazooka arms. <laughs> Darker red, that's what I thought. You got to remember, like, this is not, like, the hard thing on cutaway busts like this is that that's not like a, like a shadow wouldn't be just around the trim of her legs. She doesn't really sink into this base. So I got to remind myself not to make a false shadow there that looks a little funky. The base is just a figment of your imagination. It does not really exist. Holy Link! What the heck with that Link? Is that the longest link of all time? I think I can just go Google. Gal Gadot, or Gal Gadot, however you pronounce her name. Wonder Woman, right? We'll be fine, chat. We'll be fine. We got this. Although this might not be that suit. You know, I didn't really think about it. I didn't do my, I didn't do my homework, chat. So i got to be honest. Like, this may not be that Wonder Woman suit. I don't know. I'm not a DC fan, necessarily. Not that I dislike DC. This wasn't ever my thing.
Dark candy apple red, okay. Figured we wouldn't be on the armor for a while, so when we get there, we'll have to study it a bit. The skin's going to be a bit. Again, just real sketchy here. Not trying to worry about smoothness necessarily. I don't want to have big bulks of uh, paint that just have a hard edge to them. So I will kind of uh, come back in with the brush and do some very light strokes like that just to break up the edges so there aren't any flat transitions. Dixon, what's going on? Awesome, thank you. Will you be doing one of your SBS for the flesh? What is, what is SBS? Do I not know what this is? What is this? Step by step, is that what you're saying? Am I, am I gleaning it correctly here? You're wanting a step by step? I'll probably, when we're done with this, we'll, we'll turn her into a methodology if we like it. Yeah. I'll take a photo whenever we get the, uh, the base underpainting done. And then uh, maybe we can even go a step further with her and do something more than just a quick methodology we could actually do like a, a little bit more in-depth study, but I think her, it would be good. We've already done like Caucasian flesh on the methodologies, but uh, we could do something a little bit more involved for her for sure. Should everybody want it? Hopefully you can tell what we're doing. We're just defining a lot of our contours on the skin. Uh, I know it's with odd colors, but these are colors that are found in human skin, and that's why we're doing it this way. Um, I prefer this to, on a big model especially, I prefer this to going back and trying to glaze these colors in at the end. Uh, on a big model, sometimes that can create some weird textures and some weird visuals with it looking like, you know, hey, do those colors, did they spill on top of her? What's going on here? So we'll kind of start with them. Guess the green is where you want the skin color to be brighter, and the purple, when you use the skin color, will look darker over the purple, making it look a light source. You cut it. Well, not necessarily for the light source aspect, but you've got the right idea. The idea being that in areas where it says the way that skin starts to look in light gives you those darker tones, the purples, the blues, and the shadows. Um, and then as we work up, there's various areas that become, and we haven't done the red yet, so you'll start to see how the red plays in here too. But as you work through, like the main layer of skin, and I typically do green underneath. Uh, there's times between men and women that you would do it differently, uh, but we're just going to treat her the same way we would for any model. Um, but the, the standard color underneath skin, I, I usually use as a green. Uh, purple's in the shadows, red's in the flush areas. Cheeks, like right under the cheek, uh, temples, uh, some of the area around the eye socket and the pinch of the nose. You'll see as I place the red, and the red becomes where like the, the capillaries are closer to the skin, or when, you know, as you get, you clench your fists and grit your teeth, you know, blood builds up in those capillaries at the skin level. And so we'll start playing around with that as well.
but you got the right idea. I'm just doing it not necessarily for color with regard to light right now. I'm not even thinking in terms of light other than just standard overhead light. I'm not thinking in terms of like dramatic lighting at all. Um, so the green is really just a, a typical light placement, I guess we would say right now. but you're on the right trajectory there. Uh, a lot of times I will do what we call underpainting, and it can be done for various reasons. It can be done for exactly what you were saying, which is that you wanna just try to define your, your darkness and brightness. And in most cases like that, I would just use black and white or black, gray and white so that you could get the shadows filtered on the model, so on and so forth. We call that pre-highlighting, right? So a model like this, would be doing that, right? It's like we've got the, the white where the brightest color of armor would go, the black where the darkest shadows would be, and then in between we have various grays, right? That are really just the mixes between the white and the black, right? So just a really quick way to take a small model and get all of your lighting set up on it to where you get your textures and all that. And then you can paint over this with any color you want. You could use a wash, you could use an ink, you could use a thin down acrylic paint, and the white and the black will, uh, it will amplify and darken whatever color you put over the top. Like, so, you know, if we were to go and paint blue over the top of this guy, it'd be bright blue where the white is, and it'd be really dark blue where the black is. So that can be a really quick way to get an army on the table and get some really good uh, uh, contrast on them. Uh, or times like what we're doing right now, where we do it for uh, the skin tones, right? So it's also an underpaint for light, so to speak, uh, but it's more so for the color of the skin to make the skin look alive at the end of the day. So for flesh, you'll find me underpainting with a lot more colors than I do for normal models. Well, I say that. Like we've done a lot of, of underpainting with, you know, various colors for armor when you want to create like a, an underglow. There's all sorts of uses for it. Hopefully it causes your brain to just kind of start thinking in all sorts of creative ways that you could start finding for, you know, oh, if I paint this color under this color, that would make a really bitchin' XYZ, right? You just come up with some cool concept that could be everything from lighting effects to, you know, bruising. When we paint like Nurgle, you want that kind of gross jaundiced, you know, yellows, greens, and whites. You know, that could be a thing. any number of reasons why you would use color uh, and values to do these things. Gosh, this model's so big, I keep winding up off screen, don't I? Sally. But it's, uh, it's just a good tool to have in your, in your arsenal uh, for being able to say, oh, you know what, uh, painting yellow technically underpainting yellow is the best thing, right? You start with like dark browns and oranges and then all of a sudden painting yellow becomes real easy, right? Same for white, any of your bright colors. If you're trying to do a model with really bright armor or, you know, something like that, you underpaint with darker versions of that color or darker complements to that color and you wind up with a much easier time than getting that final color to look right on the model rather than trying to like paint yellow space marine armor yellow and then wash it and then have to work back up to yellow that can be a real chore so instead underpaint it with browns oranges get those shadow colors laid on there so that the last color you paint with is the yellow that you want the armor to look like and you already got all your shadows and I feel like her leg muscles are a little too defined there on this sculpt. That would be a lot softer, even for a very muscular woman right there. With so little leg actually showing, that might get a little weird at the end. We leave it too shadowed. So I have to monitor that as we do this. I may not do this line right here so dark at the end of the day. You can see how sloppy I'm being, basically like a dry brush almost, just to pick up areas and get color on there. Terrigan, what's going on? 
Can that technique be translated to goblin orc skin? What we're doing right now? This would be great for for uh, orc skin, right? Like when we did, what's the last orc? That, what were the uh, last orc we painted? We used green as a base and then worked up to the orange skin. But like this guy is all done with uh, like purple as a base and then black green and then, uh, you know, various whatever other color greens you needed or wanted on him. Right. So you could do the same or, or similar thing and, and keep it in greens, right? We've got greens, we've got a little red on the, the elbow there and stuff like that. But really simply, yeah. I mean, you know, just instead of what I'll do next, which is go to Caucasian flesh tones to go over it and sink the greens, just start playing off the greens and bring the greens straight up. And yeah, this could be the, the same start for that, right? You can see by just going with, you know, much brighter greens and yellows and things like that, you could make her She-Hulk. Like someone said earlier in chat. Yeah, purple and green can be the base for blue. This could be blue skin, yellow skin, you name it. These are not bad colors for just about everything. They'll play very well with lots of families of colors on top of them. Purple especially. But green also. Green's not bad. I finished a lot of models, Black Wolf. What are you talking about? That joke's old. <laughs> We've only finished six Space Marines in the course of six weeks recently. What are you talking about? But yeah, I am taking a break from our Necron today. We'll finish him. I like taking the Sunday streams and just using them as kind of palate cleansers. Work on something else that's been sitting around that I'm excited to do work on and Talk with my friends as we sling some paint. Got a chance to watch the newest, uh, I was going to say the edition, the newest uh, boys episode last night. I'm assuming, hopefully everybody's, if you're following the boys, that hopefully you're finding some time this weekend to watch. Lots, lots more character development this time around. Lots less, you know. The story's moving, but the story is moving a lot slower than last season. I'm not saying that as if it's a bad thing. But it is getting to the point where a couple more episodes, I'm going to be like, all right, already, get, get to where we need to be going.
Wonder Woman, but again, I got to be careful with this, right? I don't, I don't want to give like a false shadow down around the base just because that's the way the bust is cut, right? This kind of two thirds bust rather than at the waist. And even when they're at the waist, right, you got to remember that, oh yeah, that's not the end of the body. We're just not represented visually what is going on below the cut line. So I don't want to have this end in shadow, which is sometimes weird, right? Because it feels like you should, but I got to make sure that brightness would be considered to still go down the length of her leg below here. Whereas before I kind of put a shadow all along the bottom line. That would not be correct. Sa. Rancid Vomit, this is uh, Camo Green. I like the Camo Green underneath flesh. You could use any green right here, right? You could use this green. Uh, I really like the camo green underneath the flesh uh, because it has a lot of yellow component to it. Although a brighter green is sometimes a lot better depending on how uh, well, huzzah, huzzah. I'll just comfortable you are with your overpainting on top of this. With delight. Tara again, thank you so much for that prime sub. 25 months, does it say? Holy heck. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good to have you here again. The... Um, a brighter green survives, you know, obviously the more vibrant a color is when you're doing overpainting, underpainting like this. Um, the more vibrant of a green you get, then the more it's going to survive putting skin tones over the top. So you have to you have to play along with that. Like we will probably go in and brighten up some of this green uh, in certain areas with just green. But we'll treat that more like a highlight on these areas. And the camo green itself works really, really well for this. But it is a more subtle color, so you just have to be aware. Like, we talk about using camo green a lot. Uh, you might want to, you could use uh, bright yellow green on top of the camo green to brighten it up. Uh, or just regular green, which is what we'll do coming up next. Well, not next. I'll do uh, some burnt red in here first. It's hard because there's no arm here either. Yeah, like I'm losing track of where my shadow would actually be. So I don't know, like, right? When you don't have the arm, it's like, do you paint as if the arm is there? <laughs> do you create a fake position? Because, you know, the way this model is, this area back here would be green. But with an arm there, it wouldn't. So we just got to kind of fool it. You don't want to paint her like she doesn't have an arm right so i probably want to leave the shadow there is my gut answer do i think that the choice of one episode a week was worth it how do you mean rather than releasing the whole thing at once is that what you're asking me you know so you can't binge watch it is that is that what we're i don't understand let me know what the question is in regards to I don't care that I can't watch it all at once, although it does open you up for me personally to critique it like I just did, which is that, come on, get there already. And I can't because I can't watch the next episode right now. So, yeah, I guess I would say that, you know, for me, being able to binge is, is a good thing if you're going to take your time episode to episode and telling the story. then I'm definitely going to be more a fan of release the whole damn thing at once. But I haven't. I mean, I'm not complaining. Jen doesn't really like to binge watch too much. She can only handle a little bit of a sh given show before she has to stop and do something else. So, you know, I know we, it wouldn't have helped. Like, I don't think we would have power watched through any of this. 
Like even when we were rewatching season one, you know, to get prepped for a season two, we didn't, you know, we didn't watch like all of it at once. That's a little different because you already know what happens, so to speak. But I feel like we would probably be in a similar situation regardless, right? Like if all the episodes were available for us to watch right now, we probably wouldn't have watched more per night. Eh, maybe. I don't know. It's a good question. Bochek! What is happening? There again, the stream froze when I answered. Oh, did you get to see the orc answer? Sorry, I didn't catch that the stream froze when I was answering about the orc. The, uh, um, the answer is yes. You can definitely use this same painting technique to do uh, green skin, right? You just basically keep going instead of where I'll go into Caucasian flesh and such. Just keep moving into uh, greens. Yellow greens, you know, whatever darker greens you want to do. Up to you. If you've hung out here for long enough, you'll know that I'll say, hey, I don't care what color skin you're doing, purple. Start with purple. <laughs> Unless you're doing purple skin, I guess. Then, I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Wait, you're doing purple skin, you would start with purple. No, I would probably start with a red or a dark blue or purple skin. You can also see why you want to do the skin first, hopefully. It allows you to get paint all over everything else and not worry about it. Because I like to paint sloppy when I do particular techniques, you know, sketchy, create textures, whatever it is, right? And uh, if you're forced to try to paint with a very loose brush stroke to create a texture, but you've got, you know, something you've already painted that's finished and nice right next to it, it's like, ah! I know for this skin, we want to be able to... Uh, Create a little bit more texture with a loose brush stroke here. Definitely easier to do that when I don't have to worry about the paint in the surrounding areas. All righty. You get her? Just a little more green on the neck back here. Got the rough shapes and volumes put back on there, right? The globe of her butt, the muscles in the leg, right? Again, being able to find a little bit of transition from dark to light with the green to purple and that I use a much thinner and looser brush stroke down around the dark purple. And then I start packing the green on more towards the highlights, right? So I did get to use it as a, uh, as a value sketch as well. But that wasn't really my intent, you know? 
like you can see up here, I've left the dark purple in the in the recesses up here because uh, we're going to go with a brighter skin tone the higher up we are on the model. So I'll leave a lot more of that, you know, uh, that raw purple showing here than down here because the brighter the skin tone that goes over it, the more it's going to cover up. So I need to have, you know, a little bit more abrupt change between purple and green in my highlight areas so that it'll survive. So I'll still be able to see some of that purple as we add color on here. All right, now we go to red. You've enjoyed having more episodes like 16 to 22 compared to recent streaming shows that are eight or 10 episodes. Yeah, the eight episode thing's a little weird, although I guess if it's an hour long, I mean, in the same time that I'm doing like, well, I haven't watched Blacklist in weeks, but the Blacklist is what, it's like 40 minutes an episode or something because it was an hour long on TV, right? And so you get 40 minutes, you get 22 a season. That's amazing. If the story's good, I can see that's amazing. If, it, if it's not, if it takes, if it's 15 episodes of filler and seven that make a difference, then again, it's frustrating as hell to me. There's no perfect show. <laughs> I think that's the case, right? There's no such thing as the perfect show. And I have to put some more primer on here. I keep rubbing it off with my fingers as we turn the model around. Okay, so now we're going into burnt red. Now, if I were painting a dude, there'd be a lot more red on the tip of the nose. Women, not so much. I could put a little bit right underneath, but not so much for women. From the pinch of the temple, a little bit of red will come down and up into the forehead, down around the cheek, into the shadow of the cheekbone. My red's pretty thin so that it'll let the green and the purple show through underneath it, at least a little bit. Again, if you blend too smooth right now, you'll just lose all that blending anyway because you're going to put a whole, the, the actual skin color is going to go across the top of this and that's going to lose a lot of your subtlety and what you'll learn is that in most cases what you're really going for is a little bit more abrupt color when you do this type of painting right. good way to paint zombies right you can see how you could get to a, a very zombified look pretty quick using these colors Add in some yellow for jaundice skin, and you could have a good dead flesh.
Women and men both have a big area where your skin will flush right under the clavicle. Women tend to flush there more without being uh, under exertion, I think. Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> there again, you got to decide if you keep watching or start listening to Seventh Son from Orson Scott Card. Or Orson Scott. I always go Orson Scott Card. I'm always thinking uh, Ender's War, right? But we're always the right choice. If you have a choice of watching us or going and listening to a book, we're always the right choice. I don't even know why there's a question. A lot of shows recently you've enjoyed having more. Yeah, I remember that. Firefly was the perfect show. I like the idea of Firefly. I'm not a Firefly fanboy. I, uh, there was a lot wrong with it, in my opinion. But I did like, you know, the character development. It was fun, if nothing else. For sure, very fun. But I know a lot of people disagree with me. A lot of people are like, you know, bring back Firefly. And I do agree that that world with, uh, you know, a better budget could be amazing. I think it was a great world for exploring more world building with it, for sure. Not fainting lipstick, again, just where you have blood towards the surface, obviously the lips. Splitting the difference, or, or not splitting the difference, that's the wrong way to put it, right? Uh, splitting that line between green and purple in most of the places where I want to see this red, right? So if you're like, how the hell does he know where he's putting it? If I need to have a little bit on the, you know, inside of the globe of the breast here, then I'm just going to force it along that line where the green and the purple come together. TJ Barkley, what is going on? Hello. Welcome, first-timer. Hello, hello. This is a Wonder Woman bust, and somebody else found the link. I don't know. Uh, one of our viewers gifted this to the stream for us to paint, and I just know it's Wonder Woman. I just know it's Wonder Woman. But somebody posted a link up earlier about where it came from.
We're just doing some underpainting, setting up our uh, various skin tones for blood under the skin and things like that right now. I'm making sure that all of our colors are very textured so that as we lay color over the top, we don't get big hey, blocks. Somebody likes us. We don't want to see, at the end of the day, we don't want to see like a triangle of red underneath this gang. That's not where it works. It's all blurry and cloudy. So, Okami, thank you so much for that follow. Would you add a small amount of red along the top of the corset and the breast as a contact and pressure would make the breast hotter, different color at that line? It wouldn't be hotter, right? Depends on where pressure is, I guess, right? I mean, if you're saying that, like, the, her, her uh, corset or the, you know, the, the breastplate area is, like, pinching the skin, then, yeah, definitely, but I don't see it creating pressure. The sculpt doesn't have it that way, right? The, the breasts aren't turned into, like, pushed-up globes, right? You notice how a push-up bra works, and you get that over-inflated cleavage, and the globe of the breast becomes more pronounced. There's, like, a crease along the sides. That would be what would be happening here. We don't have that. Right. More all natural. She's properly fitted, I would say. But yes, you're correct. If you have anything that pinches tight, then you would have more red along those lines. Um, you're asking about the, the color choices. So the color choices that I'm making right now are all what goes on under the skin. Right? Purple shadows, uh, red blood, green for fatty tissue, and general subdermal layers is my thought process as I go through this. We uh, decided to do some underpainting, and we'll probably overpaint with the airbrush. And this is just a, a neat way to do that. You have, like, an old oil paints and classic oil painting and stuff. They call it, what do they call it? Verdaccio? Verdaccio? I don't remember what it was. Or they would underpaint their flesh with green, shades of green and such, so that then when you did the oil paint over the top, you do basically a glaze of your yellows. And since there weren't really flesh tone pigments back in the day, you didn't have the ability to just be like, hey, check it out, I have skin tone. Right. So you'd underpaint the skin and put various yellows and browns over the top to get the, the color of skin. We have the luxury of actually having skin color. But in order to make skin look alive still, so it looks like there's blood pumping in your veins, you uh, are better suited to use colors other than, you know, just browns and flesh tones. We're still going to use those flesh tones and browns. But we're going to use them in a way that allows our skin to look like it is actually alive. Back here with the arch of her back, we'll put more reds. As you can imagine, or I can imagine that she's pressing into the back here, even though the sculpt doesn't show it that way, necessarily. Please repeat it a little slower. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. You got to get used to me talking fast. So um, the idea for underpainting, what we're doing here, just to go over it again, is that you want to create the feel that your skin is alive. You know, or, or usually do, right? Paint zombies, obviously not. But even zombies would have 
those colors still in them, the reds from like where the blood had pooled up, right? And so what we're doing is using purples, reds, and greens to give us all the colors that are underneath the skin, right? I've got purples, I've got greens, right? And I've got reds, obviously, pinks. And then my skin tone kind of goes over the top of that. Because when you think of how skin works, it's subdermal layers, muscle, bone, fat, veins, tendons, right? And then over the top of it, skin, right? So while the skin has a color, right? And that's fine. It's also translucent. You can see through your skin to some extent, right? That at least that first subdermal layer and some further, depending on the skin. Like you see more color in the wrist than you do on the bottom than you do on the top, right? Because the skin on the top of your wrist obviously exposed to sun more often, harder, tougher, and then it gets, you know, more delicate as you get into areas that aren't exposed and, and beaten up all the time. And so you can see through more of it, right? Uh, not necessarily that it's thinner, right? But you've got all those colors. So we're painting all of these colors are those colors, right? They're the under skin colors that we're using right now. And there's all sorts of schools of thought on what colors work really well. I'm a big fan of, uh, we're using, we are Monument Hobbies. We make our own line of paints called Pro Acryl. I'm using dark purple, camo green, burnt red so far. And just brushing them on using a fairly thin paint but not super thin not so thin that it doesn't still obviously give us a little oomph where we need it uh, butts are always hard because you don't want to make it i mean at least i don't think you do you generally don't want to make it look like you know she just got spanked or anything but the globe of the butt does have more of that reddish uh, I don't want to call it flush but it really is that flush color capable of happening down there Not so much on top. Probably do a little bit right here. This probably won't survive the overpaint though, so I'm not gonna fool with it too much. Hey, somebody likes us. Hey. Scraps, what's going on?
How long have we been painting her? Yep, there you go. Dealer did it right. We just started, I mean, we, we spent the beginning, of, actually, we haven't even been painting that long because the uh, beginning of the stream, we had to sand and file. It's a 3D printed model. So we had to uh, sand and file and fill a lot of where the support posts were and things like that. So we probably spent an hour of our two hours so far, right? Two and a half hours, probably spent half of that just doing the hobby part of it, getting her ready to paint. Now we're finally painting. Uh, let's do some green. Just green. This will be the green that survives the flesh a little bit better. Puts a little bit more vibrancy into the skin. Obviously it has a larger amount of yellow and such. We want this pretty thin. And focusing up towards the higher spots on the skin, we leave the camo green alone in a lot of these areas. Notice I'll drag this green back into our red. Where I need it. Now is where we'll start setting up some of the actual brightness for our flesh, meaning that I'm not going to do, you know, all of her skin in the same amount of color like this green. I'm going to use more of it on this side where we know we want our light source. Less of it over here. And again, I realize as I'm doing this that some of the subtle greens that I do won't survive. You know, as, as we go through this process, uh, some of these colors won't stay on here. And that's just what you do. You know that going in. Leave our dark green up towards the, the jawline. Bright green coming down towards the clavicle starts to create that shadow of her jaw. Obviously, she's turned to the side, but her hair takes the place of having her head back this way so we don't go all the way up in there.
Again, very, very thin. You can see how it's, this green is drying. You can see it darkening up. Exactly what we want. Bojack, what's happening? You've been gone a long time, man. TJ Barkley says, everyone else might know about you, but since you're new, share if you will about myself. So my name is Jason. And again, thanks for hanging out with us on a Sunday. Um, they call me Slow Fuse on the internet, and uh, we have a company called Monument Hobbies. So all the brushes that you see us using are our own brushes. So we've got our Bombwick. I'm using a synthetic deck cord. It acts like a sable right now, number four. So we make our own brushes, our own paints. So all of the Procrell paints that you see me using are our own paints. Um, so we're a hobby company. We, we manufacture and, and uh, do all that right here in Arizona in the U.S. Uh, but we do the show here on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and sometimes on Sundays like today. And uh, the goal is just to show you cool painting techniques, uh, obviously using all of our products. Uh, but we do everything from, you know, this is an odd one for us, painting a bust. Our current project on the day-to-day the -day project that we're doing is this Necron Scorpec Lord. So we've been painting him for about a week now. And uh, I've been painting on and off for 40 years. I'm 50 years old. And... Uh, so I've been involved in miniatures since way, 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 way back with uh, uh, Ralph Partha D and D miniatures and you know random minis from God knows where. And so we're just uh, we'll paint anything and everything on the show here. It's more about having fun, showing off techniques and you know ways to use uh, our paints and fun stuff like I hand textured all of the carapace armor here to make it look more like rock or really, really ancient, you know, beat up. Uh, cast iron kind of look. We do all sorts of funky hobby and stuff. We just spent uh, quite a bit of our life painting various space marines using our colors, showing everybody the recipes I would use for achieving various results with, you know, different space marine chapters. Did a Raven Guard to show everybody how to use our transparent paints using transparent black, blue, and red to uh, get black armor out of that. Uh, and then Imperial Fists, doing the same, just having some fun. Painted a, a Marine a week. We finished a Marine every week for six weeks and uh, came up with a really good handful of dudes in various colors. All of it with the intent to get people more confident with their painting, right? The real idea around here is to make sure that if there's something you're trying to learn or to accomplish with your painting, that we're here to help. You know, to help you understand, like, hey, how do I paint flesh, you know, in the craziest way possible? Because that's what we're doing today. Um, you know, or how do I paint, uh, you know, using just a base coat, highlight, wash, dry brush. We'll do anything and everything. Nothing's too crazy or too basic. We're uh, happy to answer questions, not only product-related questions for our products, but just for uh, questions regarding how to do so anything in the hobby, pretty much. So again, welcome. Thanks dollar, for hanging dollar, with us. Bills, y'all. How family with the biddies. Thank you, my friend. Gaining confidence is exactly why you're on this thing. Awesome. I mean, the biggest thing for painting and art of any kind, in my opinion, everything I say here is my opinion. Goes without goes without saying, but we say it anyway. Um, is making sure that you're confident in your creation, right? So that as you go forth and you put, you know, your love and vision onto canvas or miniature or music sheet or book that you're writing, whatever it is, that you have that confidence that, you know, when you turn your baby over or when somebody sees it, right, that it's what you wanted to represent gets represented correctly. And uh, every form of art, visual or otherwise, needs that. And so that's what we try to provide. We also sell really cool products. <laughs> So on top of it all, you might learn something, and you can get some really good paints and brushes. 
There. That's all the sales. That's all the used car sales guy I'll do. But yeah, that's that's our main goal. I, I get the biggest kick out of, uh, you know, people that are new to the hobby or returning to the hobby, you know, finding new things to do, uh, you know, discovering some really cool new technique that allows them to, you know, paint their army exactly the way they had envisioned it. That stuff means the world to me. That's that's what I keep hobbying for because I've always got these crazy ideas and I want to see them come to life. And I don't always know how. So you just kind of throw stuff at the wall until it sticks, right? But we're here to help you get it to stick quicker. That's our goal. The quicker sticker upper. And we tell really bad jokes. Sometimes they have to do with farting. Fart jokes are good. Your high school teacher and started hanging with the art teachers asking lots and lots of that's awesome man glad to hear it yeah it's uh you know art is just kind of controlling your chaos right your ideas can be as chaotic as possible there's always going to be a way to make them happen sometimes it's much harder than you want to invest <laughs> and sometimes it winds up being a lot easier than you thought it could ever be so yeah the as much input you can get from as many different sources is never a bad thing My problem, I'm, I'm an old dog with no new tricks. I never ask anybody anything anymore. I'm like, ah, meh, we'll figure it out on my own. <laughs> I've probably wasted more of my life creating techniques or learning and teaching myself techniques that somebody else could have gone, hey, you know, if you turn the brush this way, that's a lot easier. So knowing that, I am now trying to uh, help other people realize that, hey, if you turn the brush this way, it's much easier. So no, we are not painting green Wonder Woman. Even though it looks like we're painting green Wonder Woman. <laughs> it would work a lot better if you didn't have to teach the class. Hey, now. Wait a minute. Don't let miniatures make you quit your job. <laughs> At some point, if you do it right, you start feeling like you're painting a weird glow-in-the-dark anatomy model. You know, we're not painting like muscle striations and stuff, so, you know, you're not going to get that carried away in general. But you start to get the feel for, oh, it looks like this person's skin got taken off. That's when you know you're doing it right. This side of her body is going to be darker, so I don't know that we want a whole lot of this green on here. It's kind of hard, though, with the volumes back here on her leg to ignore that it needs something. So maybe we'll go another stage brighter on the rest of the model. That's probably good. That's probably okay. Okie doke. Uh, now, you know, normally I would use yellow ochre, but I'm thinking we'll go with bright yellow green. What do we think? I mean, that could be kind of fun. Let's see how that works. 
ish. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, and you had also asked T.J. Barkley if you had done. Uh, I think you asked if you had do, done black and white, right? It says if you were to show that in black and white, would these show tonal value? They would to some extent, right? I mean, we can do that real quick, right? Let's take a picture. Um, we're not done with our brightness yet on this, but let's just real quick, like you know, take a a photo of her, bam, and then if we go in on our photo. Right, and edit. Uh, I think if you just choose this one and go all the way here, right? Right. Right. So if we take it all out, that's called noir. I think there's actually a black and white that doesn't have, yeah, monotone. It doesn't have all the filtering on it, right? But you see what we've done is yes, we have started to create a value sketch at the same time that we have done our color. So we're using it as a double whammy, so to speak, right? Um, it's, not, it's not as dramatic as if you just use black and white, but you can see how very quickly painting like this gives you, you know, what you're looking for as far as your value sketch, but it's also giving you all those colors of your guts, right? The life of the skin is the stuff underneath it, not the color of the skin itself. So that's why we do this. But yeah, very astute question. You can always, uh, and I suggest always taking a snapshot of your model during mid-process and just do black and white as you're learning about value and uh, volumes and see, can you read everything here, right? We get that nice dip in the, uh, the sternum and cleavage area, right? All of the other parts and pieces, her face is pretty dramatic on there with the tones, the muscle definition in the legs starts showing up. So we know we're doing the right things. <laughs> Holy poo, you're magical. <laughs> it's all, I have a good special effects team. That's it. <laughs> I like holy poo. That's going to be my new favorite thing to say. Holy poo. <laughs> Yours are all the same, working on changing that. And that's a great step. Generally, when we do um, like reviews of people's artwork on Thursdays here, we do what's called Therapy Thursday. And uh, it's a good tongue-in-cheek way to have good jokes and bad life advice. But it's also a great day to come, and it's the, the time where we get to focus on what you guys are doing. You get to upload pictures of what you've been working on into our website, and we'll take a look at them live on stream. And you can ask me direct questions about a particular miniature or technique or something that you're working on, and I'll take the time to go over it. If I, if I don't have a miniature that we can paint directly on stream, uh, I'll at least try to show you on paper by drawing, or on a base, you know, the other day on Thursday, somebody hey, asked somebody us, us about wet blending. And so we did a really quick one about, Barkley, thank you so much for the follow. We did a really quick tutorial about wet blending in multiple ways with multiple colors and things like that to show you how to use that technique to get really good blends if you don't have an airbrush and so on and so forth. So we, we actually go out of our way to, you know, actually do those things. I, really, I like the wood grain one, but I can never find it. <laughs> like what happened to the wood grain base like it's always not where i need it and i always blame jen and she's never the one that actually took it it's always me knocking it like way up underneath stuff oh well oh well i don't see it in again it's gone Hello, family. Completely off topic, but I know you've mentioned theft of intellectual property before, and I recently saw a digital STL Patreon shut down citing piracy, so I did a bit of investigation in their claims and was shocked at how prevalent the piracy of STLs turned out to be. Is this possibly the reason why traditional manufacturers such as Reaper are hesitant to enter the digital market? So yeah, the, the de facto reason why selling STLs is a bad idea business-wise right now is because there is no copyright uh, uh, precedent in law necessarily that that covers it 100 percent it's close um but and there's no like rights protection software that works right you'd have to and we could go into a very in-depth conversation here but the biggest thing for me is that i feel like you'd have to be working with the manufacturers the manufacturers would have to have the reader on the machine which doesn't exist so that when the file was put into the machine to print the printer would ver validate the file each file would have to have a number of times it could be print associated with its validation token, and then it would either print or not print, right? It's pretty, it's pretty simple security methodology. 
but it has to be implemented and the manufacturers have to get on board and they're afraid because if they do that, they know they won't sell as many machines right now and they're just riding the wave of 3D printing growing and growing and growing and growing. And part of everything, like when music became digital and video became digital for the first time, you have a lot of piracy at that level because it's new, it's fresh, it's dope, it's the best quality, I can rip it because there's no protection and yada, yada, yada. So as industries grow, there tends to be a lot of that piracy and then that tends to filter away as it gets stabilized with quality, the market, we know we can sell these devices. Um, and then, you know, you lock down with the, uh, the technology to protect it, you know, from piracy, which I, again, saying that you can protect from piracy is kind of a misnomer, right? You can never protect from piracy. It'll always be there. Every time I look for well, this dang base, where the heck is this base? I'll just throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight. It really doesn't matter at all where the base is, but it always frustrates me that it's never here when I need it. Dang it. <laughs> Where's that base? <laughs> thank you for that follow. Oh, Maratanza, thank you for the sub. It made you sick to your stomach? Yeah, I never know. I mean, like here I am painting an STL file that got printed out by one of our viewers. I don't know. Is this an, uh, this is, I, I can't guarantee it, but I, I don't know if this is an authorized DC property. Maybe we're painting a bootleg copy of something here. I don't know. You know, and shame on me, right? You shouldn't, uh, I'm a big, uh, opponent to theft of IP because, you know, having been in, um, the music business for so long, and have always been involved in creating stuff through my entire life. I worked in the electronics industry as an inventor, glorified wannabe engineer, but I have my name on a bunch of patents for things that I worked on to create. And in doing so, you know, want to make sure that those things don't get stolen by other people who didn't do the work. You know, the work to create stuff is, is good work, right? It's hard work. Uh, the reward is not always very large. So you want to make sure that you get the benefit of being known as the creator of something, right? That's part of the value of having, you know, forged that creation. So I'm a staunch supporter of rights. And yet it becomes harder and harder every day to, you know, continue along that line because the, you know, it's, how do you tell? How do you know what's good and what's stolen, you know? Did you buy your last Forge World piece directly from Forge World or did you get it on eBay? <laughs> you know, because I'll admit, right? I buy stuff on eBay all the dang time. Was it legit stuff? I mean, most, I don't buy a whole lot of Forge World-esque stuff or resin stuff. But yeah, who knows? And the STL stuff is, you know, you put an STL out there and somebody can just copy the file. It's that easy. And once it's copied, they can turn around and sell it. All right, so we put some bright yellow green on here. I got some questions to answer, though. Uh, what's my verdict on Blacklist, Ray? Um, we'll talk about it when you get here. It, it's okay. It, the show itself makes me want to find out what happens in the story. But the way they get there is like, either either don't give me 22 episodes a season because there's a lot of filler I don't need because they just tell little bits of the main story in each one, a la X-Files. You know, it's much better than the X-Files because the X-Files had total episodes that had nothing to do with the main storyline for weeks and weeks. So I, you know, I, I like it better that way. There's always something to get from it that keeps you going, you know, but it's like that drug, right? It's like, you know, here's a little hit, you know, but come on, man, just tell me more. Cause I just get tired of watching the same show with it. I like, I hate the whiny lead actress. She drives me nuts. You know, I really only like what's his nuts character. So I don't know. I don't know. Starting to open back up and trying to get back to normal, Boshek. It's good to hear. It's been a long journey. It's going to be longer still, probably. Surprised I'm painting a comic book character after the turtle and IP issues, as I'm presuming this STL wasn't licensed from DC Monument. I, that I don't know, right? I don't know. 
So yeah, I'm a hypocrite right now because we stopped painting the the turtle because I talked to that guy directly and he's just legit stealing, you know, that IP. And he continues to do it, you know, and I was like, oh, that's rough, man. I don't know what to do here. You know? And it's, uh, you know, it's that thing of, okay, well, yeah, they're using somebody else's IP unlicensed, you know, but they used it in a way that's a derivative work and they're yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, yeah, but as soon as you start making money off of it, that's a tough call. In my opinion, right? Is that that's a real tough call. It's like, when do you say that it's not okay? You know, if you're using it for commercial purposes, then it's, it's tough. I had that problem with Creature Caster, right? When we were working with Creature Caster, it was always a struggle for me because I was like, you know, this model is just too much of a ripoff. You know, and we'd talk about it and they'd tell me all the reasoning and I'd be like, okay, I get it. All right, I get it. You know, and I'd go back to, okay, maybe it's not that big a deal. And then it hit me again. I'm like, wait, this is a big deal, you know? Again, so now the bright yellow green is going to be definitely a highlight. It is not intended as a color that's underneath your skin, although it, it would carry on the green and the yellow of flesh tones, right? But I'm putting it on here just to make sure that we have some value posted up underneath so that as we do the flesh tones over the top of this, that they will adhere to our brightness and darkness a lot better. And you remember we took the black and white picture and it already looked pretty good. This will really bolster it up, right? This is going to give us that pop that we really want on a miniature. There's a, per a pretty dramatic jawline, so we'll go ahead and hit a little bit of color along the, the bottom of the jaw, but not a lot. I don't want to make her look too manly. Hand bone. You need to try out this technique. On bigger models, it's great. You'll see a lot of people doing stuff, uh, maybe not exactly the way I do it. There's methods, like everything. There's ways to do what I'm doing here that, you know, as many methods to do it as there are artists, right? Hey, somebody likes us. But on a larger bust, you'll find it being a very refreshing way to do the, the skin, allows you a little bit more leeway. You know, because you're trying to cover more surface area on larger busts, you, uh, you just always have to be kind of careful about how, um, how you try to go and apply these types of uh, looks. Like, you know, the blood under the skin and stuff can look really janky if you try to glaze it over the top on a very large area it starts looking like spilled juice, right? We always bring that up. And thank you for that follow. Ravery, thank you so much. Welcome, welcome. I like it because it allows you to be sketchy, right? Anytime, I, that sounds so funny when we say it that way. Right? It allows you to be sketchy, bro. You know? Uh, it allows you to paint a lot sketchier because you're going to be putting paint over the top of this that'll handle most of the blending for you. Your, your air quotes blending 
doesn't come from blending. It comes from the uh, kind of abstract of one paint covering up another paint, right? And so in that sense, it gives us a lot of freedom in, uh, in how we paint. I'm always up for any technique or any way that I can alter a technique to allow me to sketch my paint a little bit more, right? So I can kind of stipple and add these textures and be a little bit looser with my brush stroke and all that kind of stuff. Learn something new every day. That's what's so great about waking up, right? As long as it's stuff you, you like to learn. <laughs> I don't want to learn how to call my insurance after having a wreck every day, but, you know, I get your drift. Uh, obviously, I'm painting very, very thin with this. You can see how it is allowing all of my colors to come through underneath. And I keep drawing it over towards our light source, which is to our left, her right. Again, on these larger areas, I'll just hit it very quickly. And very thin to make sure it's set up the way I want. Kind of painting it, like we say, the rule of 50%. Putting half as much of this color as I did the last color of green is the idea. Sometimes you'll, you'll overdo it uh, because you want it to be brighter. Like here, I'll just come across the entire top of this shoulder because it's over towards our light source. So I'll paint a lot more than 50%, but there's a reason for it, right? This is like maybe the light is right here. Who knows? Keep working with that same color, bright in this case, bright yellow green, until I get to the uh, opacity that I want and have narrowed it into the shine spot that I'm really looking for.
But a sec, what's going on? Be cheaper. Well, with the way that Reaper charges for their minis, yeah, it's probably cheaper just to buy their their bones stuff. I hate that material, but yeah, you know, you're not wrong. Than to print them all out and wait. I mean, you know, there always will be. I love the uh, concept. We talk about it a lot, right? Well, we seem to be talking about it a lot more recently. The concept of printing minis, I just love, right? The on demand, the hey, you know what I really needed for my tournament coming up was this thing that you can't get because it's out at the store. So how do you get it? Well, you don't get it. So how do you play it at the tournament? Well, you don't, unless you can borrow it from your friend. Well, you know, I don't have any friends. Well, you're screwed, right? <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, what do I do? Well, you know, you, you can get a 3D printer. And if there is a way to have all the rights, you know, implemented to where the copyright holder and the rights holders are protected and can earn the money until, you know, they feel comfortable releasing it to more of a public domain or whatever, then, uh, you know, you're kind of stuck. Because you need to have that, that technology available. Or you get, like we said, we, you know, people are really interested in doing this stuff. So piracy is big at the beginning of these technologies. It's just the way it goes. A little bit more brightness on that side of her face. Go ahead and include glaze it over the entire side of that face so it brightens it up, keeps this in kind of a darker, cool nature if I Lays a little bit more of that green on everything that's over on this side. Again, this is not going to survive the overpaint, so it's kind of a waste, <laughs> to be honest with you. The glazing and subtle blending that I might be trying to do with these paints is not going to survive. So, But I will do it anyway sometimes, like you see me doing, as I'm getting a feel for what I want the model to look like. Right? Maybe I just want to play around with the color right now and say, oh, if I do this, that looks really bitchin'. You know, and then that gives me a good way to uh, get a feel for what I do at the end of the model. You know, when I start putting the flesh tones on there that I want to create these particular uh, highlights and shadows and ideas and tones. Probably would need to take a picture so I can remember. Not the best at the whole remembering thing. Feel like I slept during class when they told you about the remembering techniques. What was that game? You know, the one that helps you with your memory? You mean memory? Oh, that's why I always forget. It's the same name as that thing I forget. And it still looks better than what you paint. What does this? Come on now. Don't start with that. It's not looking bad, though. We're going a lot further than we normally do with our underpainting just because we're, we're reaching out on a bust and doing it. Normally, when we're doing just a, a you know, 28, 32 millimeter model, we wouldn't take this same amount of uh, interest in getting all of these colors on here. Uh, we also determined that we're going to do the uh, airbrush glaze for the top coat.
Come back with the green on this. Feel like I'm dumping from my bright green into my red and purple too quick on this side. So you can always come and dial all that back in if you feel like, because when you go and you do your overpainting on this, you are going to wind up in a situation where your values can dump and get way too out of line. So I just put some of the green back so it didn't go bright green into severe darkness that quick. I need to do a little bit of that up here too. Along her breast line, right in here. Jason, that's about way too thin. Not just too thin, but way too thin. Something like that. We need a little bit on her behind back here. All righty, there we go. And that is uh, Wonder Woman underpainted. We could go brighter. We could continue doing this. Like you could, you could continue highlighting and, and adding in more color. We could add in pale yellow, which might be a good idea on here. Maybe we do that. Let's do it just to show you. We're, we decided we were committing to doing this. Let's go ahead and do it. Got to get a smaller brush now though. I'm gonna grab a number three. To avoid all IP infringement is now painting Wonder Hulk She-Woman. Yes, yes, this is not anything other than what, it, I mean, it's not, I mean, I don't know, who, I, uh, it just showed up. <laughs> For a black light painting and then you work on some sorcery and you look totally skin tone, that's the idea, right? Before we get out of here today, I will spray the first coat of skin tone on this and you will see where we're going. Nimriel, love how your thumb always seems like it's becoming part of the mini, yeah, right? I mean, that's the goal, right, is to, uh, this is the test bed, right? This is how I test all my colors. Is it going to work? I don't know. Paint your thumb. You tell me. There's no end to how bright uh, or dark you can take your values on your underpainting, okay? You can underpaint and go all the way to white. We've done it before. You can do grays and whites and such. Um, here, we're not going to worry about glazing too much. We're just going to come in and start placing in the kind of values we would if she was green skinned. Like, think about what would you do right here, right now, if this was She Hulk? Well, I'd put a shine on her forehead about like that. Yeah. I'd catch this upper brow line a little bit, a little bit here. Right? And I'd catch top of her cheek here a little bit. Further around the curve of the cheek on this side, because this is towards our light source. Again, don't want to cover up all of my previous color. And I'm not worried about blending it as much, right? That's the key here, is that you're, uh, if you spend a whole lot of time blending, you'll be upset because it won't show up at the end. Because the colors that go over the top are not going to allow the blend to have as much of an impact. So you're really just doing this for location of color and value, right?
much less over here. A little bit of shine. Snuck in there. a little bit of my bright yellow green lays it right back over that if I can get a little bit more yellowish tone to it Dark lady, what's going on? Thank you, thank you. And we just picked we just picked this model up and literally picked up, cleaned the resin, filled the resin, primed the resin, and now we're painting the resin. So <laughs> we've uh we're just having some fun here with underpainting, getting our flesh dialed in before we turn her flesh colored, right? As I have less and less paint on the brush, I can use it as more of a filler and blender. Start getting our dramatic light set up. Some of that comic book scritching on her. None of these textures will last. So, well, some of them may. Depends on, like, the brighter the color, the more this texture may show towards the end. But that's not the goal here. I'm not. I'm not looking to get the sketchiness of the uh, the application to live through the uh, the top base color. If it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. 
No skin off my teeth. Again, I'm running out of paint on the brush, so my paint is not going to be as dramatically bright right now. Because I'm already using thin-ish paint. So because of that, I can go in and do the areas that are away from my prime light source and be okay. I'm going to get less overall color and vibrancy out of it because the brush is almost done. That's a little chunky right there, so we'll just kind of stretch that out a little bit. Okay. Bingo. Looking pretty good. Now, just like we did on the face, and once again, we'll take a little bit of our bright yellow green, and we'll just go back to where this yellows all that up a bit. Just kind of ties it all together. This is just a lot of water and very little paint. Again, just smack it right over where you did those highlights. If it blends out into your other colors, that's great. Doesn't matter. You can see how thin it is. It's letting everything show through anyway. Bingo, now we're done underpainting. Ta-da! There you go. And believe it or not, all we've done here is create all these colors that we see underneath our own skin, right? Those yellows, the greens, the purples, the reds. That's what all this is, right? 
Now, before we go and overpaint, we want to make sure that we've got enough of everything showing. I'm missing some red on the cheeks now with all that green going over it. So let's uh, go back in and dial some of that in. Everything else looks pretty good. There's really just that right cheek. Hootie hoot, what's going on? It's uh, some Wonder Woman bust. Armin's Wrath, one of our viewers, printed it out and sent it to us. Long time ago, actually. I say a long time ago. It's been quite a while. Darken this up a little bit too much. Bingo. Let's remember, because I'm going to remember to take a snapshot. I told you guys, somebody had asked for if we were going to be doing a longer step-by-step -step on this. And so the answer is yes, we will. I just have to remember to take the photo. So here goes in the background, the photo. And we can take the photo again, right? And uh, let's duplicate it. I think if I go like this and I go duplicate, right? So we'll take one, edit it. Again, I think we just go over here and we go mono, done. All right. Now, if we look at it, you can see how before we were talking in terms of, okay, is this also taking care of our values, which it does very, very well. Right? We get brightness and darkness the way we want them on here. Right? And also the undertone colors that we need. Works pretty good. Deadbeat. Yeah, well, any color, that, that's a good test for any colors that you do. Again, remember, the, the thing that we talk about being the most valuable with regards to painting anything, canvas, whatever. Well, maybe not your house. Who cares, right? You just need the whole color to be even. But if you're painting things that you're trying to, you know, create a visual uh, beyond just a panel of color, then value is your biggest thing, right? It's the brightness and darkness going where you need them, you know, making sure that uh, it's all in the right relation and that you can... Uh, uh, get the volumes and the definition of the piece in the viewer's eye. So if you're painting a, a basketball on a 2D surface, right, you need to be primarily concerned with, okay, you know, how do I make this look like it has depth that you could pick it up, right? Uh, I am going to go back through here real quick and brighten up a little bit of this side of her face. Using the bright yellow green, very, very thin. Not too much. Just a little, so it's a little bit brighter down around the chin line than over on this side. I don't want to overtake that red that we just put on there again, or our, all of the purple. I just want this side to brighten up just a hair.
Bad, does it? Go. That gets more of what I'm looking for. Because we saw in the photo that right face was just a little darker than I wanted it on the cheek line on this side. So we'll take another photo. I wasn't planning on this being the hey, check it out. If you do this, look what it look what it does for you, but it does. All right. Do the same thing here. Let's duplicate this. Bang. Edit this one. Mono. Mucho better. All right. Now we have, of course, they're not right next to each other. You see how dark her left side of her face? So that's the lighting side, right? So this side over here should be that dark. This side, not quite that dark. So that allowed us to brighten it up. Still got darkness under the cheek, but brightness as we push along the jawline there, much better. Right? Much more in line with the brightness of the, the clavicle and the sternum now coming up. Makes sense. Her hair is going to have some shadow on her face too, but that's much better. So that's a good test. Good way to look at it. All right. Quick fix. Quick fix. TJ Barkley, are there videos? Yep. Yeah. Yep, all the Twitch VODs, and then you can go to YouTube. There's some. TJ Barkley's like, I want to see the skin. Now we're about to do it. We're about to do it. I've been trying to keep up with, with uh, Barkley, guys, but yeah, if you can do, if you can tag me, it helps a lot. How the Hulk becomes Wonder Woman, right? <laughs> Telemachus. Uh, I'm just setting up underpainting. We're going to put skin tone on top of her. Next color we're going to use is Shadow Flush. Right? But it is a very, I mean, it's a good sketch of if you were doing She-Hulk, this would be, I mean, you could sell this as She-Hulk, right? I mean, it's, it's very sketchy because we've been doing it as underpainting as opposed to the final color. But you can see how this creates a style that you could paint all of your miniatures like this and be just fine. We were a little loose at the very end there, but, you know, you could paint all of your miniatures and do just fine like this, right? And have this be the way your style is, that sketchy kind of, you know... Don't worry so much about your blends. We haven't blended anything. We've just basically been, you know, sketching colors over colors, but we get a very blended look. And we've pushed our values very deep with our reds and purples for our shadows and very bright with our uh, pale yellow and bright yellow green and our highlights so that now when the flesh tone goes over it, all of those colors will read from underneath that. And we'll build it up very, very slowly with very, very thin paint, right? Shadow flush. And the shadow flesh, you're going to be surprised at how bright shadow flesh is going to be on top of that pale yellow. So we're going to get a really, really good skin highlight on there, too. If your beard were a little longer, you'd call me Santa. <laughs> Damn you. Have you got a good picture that could be used for an underpainting methodology, maybe? Well, this one. Now, right? Isn't that what we just did? <laughs> we could do this as a methodology. That's why I took the picture. And turn the black and white. I'll put the black and white. I'll post that and this just as a progress shot. But we could use those as a methodology for sure. All right, next is airbrush. Now, you can do what I'm about to do with the brush. You don't have to use the airbrush. So don't feel like, oh, my God, I don't have an airbrush. I just watched all of this. I can't do this. No, you can. Uh, painting thin and glazing with your brush is a thing, right? Um, so everything I'm about to do 
you could do with a brush. A little bit harder on a big model to do it with a brush, but not impossible. And only harder in the term of, uh, or in the sense that, you know, you've got so much surface area to cover that some people aren't very confident with their brush strokes to be able to maintain uh, smoothness over large surfaces. Happens to the best painters, right? I know lots of painters who are super, super awesome painters at 28, 32 millimeter. And as soon as you get into big creatures, they're like, oh, it drives me crazy. I hate it, right? Because you have so much surface area to cover that your same brush techniques don't provide you with the same results, right? You're used to painting a certain way, your brush strokes and your brush size. Some people paint with a very small brush. Well, when you paint a big mini and your comfortable zone is with a very, very small brush, that's usually not a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So Shadow Flesh, let's scoot her out of the way. Shadow Flesh airbrush. Okay. Oh, gotcha, Russ. Un, deux, trois, whatever four is. I'm going to go ahead and do five. Five drops. She's a big girl. All right. Uh, flow improver. I live in the desert. So this next step that I'm going to show you, I put five drops of paint in there. It's not a ton of paint. All right, this next step that I'm going to do is the thinning step. And so a lot of times when you hear me talk about painting, I say thin seven to one. Uh, you know, seven parts thinner, one part paint. So seven drops of thinner, one drop of paint, however your brain constitutes that, right? Sometimes I say 70% thinner. So that would be seven drops of paint to three drops of, or seven drops of thinner to three drops of paint, right? How I, I use different language from time to time. But here, where our studio is in the desert, it's very dry. I would no humidity at all. So I'm going to only use Flow Improver to thin my paint. For you elsewhere, I've had a lot of people contacting me here lately saying, man, I'm trying to do that thing you did in your methodology and I just can't make it work and I use a lot of flow improver and the paint sucks, you know? And I'm like, ah, where do you live? And this particular person was like in the Pacific Northwest. I was like, wrong. Use water to thin your paint or, or uh, airbrush thinner or something else and then just use a little bit of flow improver to do the flow improver job, which is to keep from having tip dry. Uh, because we're in the desert, I can use flow improver for everything. Like I don't have to, some water and some flow improver. It's just easier for me to go in and I could do the water and flow improver thing. But for me, I'm just going to go and, and get an idea, right? Five drops of paint and I'm going to go five million drops of flow improver, right? So a bunch of flow improver, way more flow improver than paint. So let's call this seven parts flow improver to three parts paint, 70%, 80%. The idea is that we want to be able to have this paint go onto the model super, super thin, but still hold together so that we can do what's called a filter. Um, and a filter, imagine a camera filter. What would you think of if, if I told you, hey, you know, uh, I have a camera filter for your camera that's orange. What would that do, right? It would make every picture that you took have shades of orange in it, right? because the filter changes the way the lens sees the world. It's like you putting on red glasses or orange glasses, or in this case, flesh-colored glasses. We're gonna put flesh-colored glasses on this model, right? Not really, that's really not the way to say it, right? But so here's the color that we're painting, right? Shadow flesh. But I had to really go hard to get that color because here's how it's gonna look. Believe it or not, I am painting my hand. Well, let's paint over my thumb, not while holding the model. Right, so here's all the colors that are on the model. This is the way we're going to paint. So instead of just blow flesh tone, it's going to do this. See that subtle change coming in? A little bit of orange, a little bit of yellow. See that? Then the next coat will go on. All right, then the next coat will go on. I'm really piling it on here, so... Right, see what's happening? That's how we're going to be painting this model. Right. Flow improver is miraculous stuff. Yes, it can also be the most dangerous stuff you've ever mixed with your paint if you live in a humid area, so don't do it. <laughs> I mean, you can put it with your paint, just don't use it like I use it. All right. Okay, so let's start with a butt cheek. I'm going to get overspray on everything. I don't even care.
Got to make sure I get in there in the cleft of her butt, right where the purple is, too. Look at the changes that are happening. Oh my God. Oh my God. Right? Skin tone. Ta-da. Like, uh, really, Fuse? It's magic, dude. Literally magic. Would I lie to you people? Probably. But not about this. Dark lady, it's a booty. <laughs> it's not alien booty anymore. Well, she's not really an alien, is she? She's not like Superman alien. She's just from that Amazonian island in the middle of nowhere, right? I am covering everything, by the way. I'm not putting any more or less paint anywhere on the uh, on the body, right? I'm literally just covering it, right? One hundred percent flesh tone. Now notice how we started with a very dark skin tone. When doing this, you wanna go with a darker color than you may actually want at the end of the day, because as you paint so thin, it's going to appear much brighter, as you can tell, right? Like I told you, you'd be surprised at how bright shadow flesh can get when we paint this way, and that's what's happening, right? You're seeing it get much, much brighter, especially over the pale yellow and such. Other butt cheek. And I'm calling this just one good even coverage, right? Although it's probably more like three coats with how much I'm hitting the model right now, right? But one good even coat. Like I'm not worried right now about what is more or less uh, covered. You know, meaning like I, I'm going to go back and put more skin tone maybe on that red so it doesn't look like her butt got spanked, right? But right now, look at that. Like, papow, right? Look at this. Look at that. And look at how easy it was, right? I'm by sketchy, really fast painting. Like, look at that. Those aren't blends. That's just like using a pencil, right? It's just knowing where to put the color. And then look at how this smooths everything out. Can't see any of that. But you get all of it. Bright mid-tone, greens, purples, reds, everything's there. Right. This one's already starting to dry, so you can see how as you paint this thin, as the paint dries, it will not be as vibrant. So that skin tone starts disappearing. That's why you'll have to do multiple layers. That's why I say only do like one good layer first and then move on to your next area. Do the whole model, then come back, because you will, you will find yourself adjusting this as you go. Houdini, now I'm Houdini Santa. <laughs> Are you David Copperfield? Face. couple inches away from the model here. I'm not really worried about distance because we're just going for coverage, so. Hey, somebody likes us. Hey. Inner Excellence, what is going on? Thank you for that follow. Would you consider the shadow flesh your shade mid-tone? The shadow flesh your shade comma mid-tone? How do you mean, how family? Explain that to me. Right? I mean, right now, shadow flesh is all of that, 
right? Because as a filter, it becomes everything. As long as you have all of your shade and mid-tone done correctly with your underpainting, then your filter becomes your shade, your mid-tone, and your highlight, right? This color gets to do all of it because it inherits the values of the colors underneath it. Does that make sense? That's what's happening right now, right? So shadow flesh is becoming bright shadow flesh, dark shadow flesh, reddish shadow flesh, you know, all of it. But when I'm painting without the underpainting, if that's what you're asking, shadow flesh is my mid-tone generally, right? That's how I treat it when I'm painting models, like just normal, without all this underpainting voodoo. Again, I'm not trying to get all of it done at once. I just want to get a good, complete coverage going. And make sure she doesn't look like She-Hulk. She's still not going to look well, right? Because there's still going to be a lot of this other color in spots that we don't want. Right? But hey... I wish, I wish we had another model next to her, right? We can't show you side by side. But look at the difference. Right? We're starting to see skin become skin. Now we'll start going back. More coverage. No area should go untouched with this color, but how much of this color you put on is kind of up to you, right? There's going to be certain areas where, you know, you're not going to want to throw a whole bunch up underneath her chin because you want to keep that with that dark purple. But you also want to make sure that the underneath of her chin that is all dark purple gets a little bit of skin tone so it doesn't look like she dipped her chin in purple paint, right? Could you take another picture through each layer? Yeah, I will. As soon as we, yeah, I should do that right now, right? Good choice. All right, so this is one, technically one layer of the flesh. Thank you for that. I'm the worst while we're just streaming. I'm the worst at like, oh, here's picture number two, right? Okay. So, right, let's, uh, Zoom in. I'm like, I'm going to pinch zoom on my phone. That doesn't really do us a whole lot of good, right? All right look at that versus that. Holy hell, are you kidding me, right? It's magic, people. It's magic. I get too into it. Yeah, I get tunnel vision, man. I'm like, oh, you know what would have been cool is if we'd have taken a bunch of pictures while we were doing this so that at the end of the day, people could tell what I did. <laughs> I mean, who'd have thunk, right? Who'd have thunk that might be a good idea. All right, so now with the second layer, we're going to start being more focused on where we put the flesh tones. We're going to start working them uh, where they need to go based on the particular part of the body we're painting, right? So like here on her buttocks, right? I don't want quite so much red. So we're going to put a little bit more of this flesh tone over the red and then out onto the highlight area. Same thing over here. A little bit more on this green. We've got this green musculature going down our leg. So here I'm just going to stay away from the dark area though. So now I'm basically going to paint that muscle group a little bit better, right? Even though I'm painting thin, I can go in and do this color in exact areas, right? So just paint that line of that muscle. Same thing on the front of the leg here. Right. Okay. 
Now, I have to be careful. I don't want to cover up all my brightness, right? Because I will. Eventually, it'll all turn into shadow flesh. So I got to be a little bit careful with that. Shadow flesh is a darker skin tone. So if we don't watch it, we wind up with knocking our highlights back too far. That's pretty good. Okay. Much better. Too much green on the back still, so we just kind of take that top-down approach, spray down on top of our green, get in here on the small of the back. That's about all the damage we can do before we start darkening her up too much. Okay, so Shadow Flesh will start darkening this model up now if we start doing too much more. So the next layer will have to be Tan Flesh, right? Because realize, this is what we're painting with, guys. That's the color we just put on top of her. So if we keep layering it up, the whole model will become this color, and that's too dark, right? We won't get the other colors showing through. Right now, this is looking pretty good. We'll let this dry a little bit more while we discuss. And then I'll hit it with one more layer, then we'll take another picture. I'm not going to take another picture right now because it's too subtle between the last one. We'll do one more layer, and then they'll show the contrast in them, right? If you take a picture every time I do an airbrush spray, they'll start. once you get the skin color on there, it stops looking like you've done anything. Until you get to the end. Boom. Yeah, this is a 0.3 needle. Uh, prayer run. It, this is a Canon HD video camera. Uh, Vixia something 870. I don't remember. Little bitty handheld Canon HD camera. But yeah, TJ Barkley. So filtering, right? is, like I said, uh, you know, imagine if we took, uh, I would, you know what I need? I said, I need a colored piece of film to put, like, over the camera here, right? That would be amazing. I don't have anything like that, though. Do I? Do I? You know what? Let's try something here real quick. Let's do something silly, because I think this might be a really good explanation for filtering. Hold, please. I'll be right back.
I have saran wrap. Let's do this real quick experiment. Crappy to do. We got some paint in here. I think I just made a filter, right? Sorta, of, kinda. If I go, there's what the camera sees. If I go like this, right? I mean, it's not gonna work really well. I don't wanna get paint on the camera, but you get the idea. Like, without and with the color on there, kind of a thing. Does that make any sense at all to you? Everything gets turned that color but I still see all the colors underneath, right? I got flesh tone on the on the filter, but I can still see the gray of the table and the brown of the table and the shadows and the brightness, right? Does that make sense? That's what we just did, right? We just took that flesh tone and did exactly that um, by spraying a very, very thin coat of paint over the top of other paints, right? We can still see those other colors on here, the greens and the purples and the reds and the pinch of her neck, all of that, right? We still have all those colors on the model, but they're not as um, pronounced, which is why we had to paint them very pronounced, okay? Back to our pictures. So we had to paint them very pronounced, like boom, She-Hulk, right? Lots of green, lots of purple, lots of red, lots of, you know, pale yellow. We needed to make sure they were very, very intense colors so that when we filtered the flesh tone over them, they're still visible because they now have to fight through that skin color to be seen at all. The skin color is thin. That helps, right? But, you know, as we layer up, they disappear. The more and more I spray the model, the less and less of the green and the red and the purple get shown. You can filter and obscure to where it just becomes completely opaque. But the filter is just a very, very thin coat of paint over the top of other colors to allow those colors to show through, but to alter their hue and their value by placing another color on top of them. Does that make sense? That's filtering. Okay. Boom. I mean, you, you, we just saw it in action exactly the way I use it all the time, right? Is paint these really weird colors for what the hell reason? Oh, well, that's the reason because now the skin looks alive. She looks like she has a heartbeat. There's blood in her veins, right? You could go up and poke her and the skin would move as opposed to just dark brown, mid brown flesh tone, right? Now we have yellows, we have greens, we have purples, we have all of those colors that we find in our own skin, right? If you look at the bottom of my wrist there, right? You wind up with the ability to create all of those same colors. I get bonus points for teaching invent. I was like, I don't know what to do. How about this? <laughs> Does that make any sense? I mean, you know, we talk about, you know, seeing the world through rose colored glasses. Well, that that's filtering. You're filtering your vision. I know that's a, that's a totally different statement. Sorry. And I'm, I'm talking without the mic closed. Hopefully you heard all that. Um, you know, but the, the reality is that when we, when we say those things, you know, you've all worn, you know, playful colored glasses and everything you look at, turns a version of that color, but the world around you still retains its darkness and its brightness. And in some cases, some of those colors can still come through. Even if you're looking through like green plastic glasses, some of those other colors come through, right? Your sunglasses are a filter, right? They are a, a shade filter that goes over the world. So if you put your sunglasses on, you can still see some of the color, right? But its value has decreased, right? Because you're trying to eliminate all the brightness, the shine, right? So what was bright red when you put your sunglasses on is still red, but now it's a darker red because you put gray over the top of that red. You can do that with paint, right? Not just with light. So that's just what we did here, right? Is we just put flesh colored glasses over our model, technically, right? And we get skin tone. All right, so let's, before this paint dries up too much, let me put my eyes back on and let's do one more filter layer just to even some stuff out. And then we'll move to a little bit brighter color in the tan flesh. Right. 
I just want to make sure her legs don't look like zombie flesh here with too much green. Now you'll find that I start painting it very directionally, meaning that I'm, I'm firing the airbrush from the top of the model downward so that this color only gets on the highlighted areas and not into the shadows, because most of my shadows I'm really happy with. I just have a couple of areas here that the highlights need to be a little bit more skin toned and get rid of some of the green. And by keeping the airbrush directional like that, uh, it means that the model blocks the color, right? The color can't get where it can't get, right? Firing at a three-dimensional object becomes one of our coolest tools. Bingo. And you see how thin, the, the key here is the thinness of the paint, because you can tell how much paint, right? We put tons of layers of paint, right? But all of our colors are still showing through. All of our greens, purples, reds, everything still has a chance to play a part. If you don't thin your paint enough, well, then you lose all that, right? Then you start covering up those colors very quickly. So it's a, it's a technique that requires some training. You got to practice in order to maintain your thinness of your paint. But the easy way to remember it is to just make sure you thin your paint too much as you're learning, right? And the key when airbrushing oh, like this, one of the best things the airbrush is for is the atomization of paint and the fact that it can do this thin painting super easy, right? Uh, and the thing is, just keep the brush moving. You'll notice that I'm never holding the brush still for longer than a split second. And the reason for that is you don't want to let too much thin paint build up on the surface of the model because it will start to pool and move. It'll spider out, right? We're painting so thin, like see this one? It grew legs, right? If you sit still, that's exactly what it happens. It's because it's just too thin. So the air from the airbrush starts pushing the paint because the paint's too thin. So it grows legs, spider webs out. So just be careful and make sure that you're not doing that. Okay, am I in the right spot? And you're painting and then all of a sudden it goes, because now you've under, you spent all that time underpainting and you've blown out your underpainting with that top coat. Okay. Bingo, let's take another picture. She looks really, really good. Actually, I'm going to clean out the airbrush first because if I take another picture right now, the paint will dry. Ian, what's going on? I click stream at noon. So... Straight up 12 o'clock. Did I tap my password on my phone? Probably. I mean, you have to have my phone for that to matter, so who cares? <laughs> if you steal my phone, then we're, we got problems. Did you do the, the Procrow paint labels have a symbol for opacity, opaque to transparent? Uh, no, but we have transparent paints. Right, so some of our line are called transparents, so like transparent brown has a very low, well, it, it still can go to a very high opacity, but it starts at a lower opacity than our normal paints. All of our regular paints that don't say transparent on the bottle um, are standard opacity, like they are like as close to one coat coverage as you'll find. So the shadow flesh is a very opaque color. That's why I had to thin it down like 70%, 80% thinner versus paint.
and the mix. No, it's definitely not my ATM pin on my phone. That would be funny, though. But you would still have to have my ATM card, so good luck with that. Uh, let's put those aside. We needed to take a photo. Right, and... I should have taken pictures of her. Well, it's not really interesting. I mean, not that her butt's not interesting, but there's not a whole lot of flesh back there. So definitely the front is fine. All right, so let's see if there's a... Is there a... Uh... Yeah. So that's much better. That shows a much better difference between the two. So we started here. Right. First layer, shadow flesh. Second layer of shadow flesh. But you can see how if you go much further, you get all shadow flesh, you start losing the green, right? Much more greens, much more yellows, reds, and purples here. But it's it's too much. I mean you could you could get away with doing this. It's a very stylized way to paint. I don't like it. Right? So I do this. Still have all the colors that we need, right? But now we've got skin color. Right? But she's very tan, so we need to go in with some tan flesh over the top of it to lighten her up. Okay. Remind me later to get colored film. That would be a good way to do it if I could just get a hard piece of, like, plastic. You know, I just need to, you know, I, I thought we had, like, storage tubs, but they're all clear. So that doesn't do anything. Uh, a filtered lens for the camera, they make them that screw on there. So I might just buy one of those. I think they're, like, $12, and they have a colored, like, uh, I know they at least have a, uh, a, what do you call it, a, um, what's it called? Sepia, right? Sepia tone filter? For camera? I bet they have one for this. Or there might even be a digital setting on the camera now that we mention it. Let's give me some time. Let me see if I can if I can play around with stuff here. Let's see here. What if we go here? Is there anything like that? Low light? Spotlight? No. No, none of that stuff works. What's this? Cinema? No. Follow a baby's growth? What? What the? I don't know what this thing is doing. I'll look at it and see. Maybe there's a way to, uh, to pull something off that, oh, now he screwed everything up. Now it has a filter on it. Now it's like all weird colors. What did I do? What did I do, chat? Oh, because I put it in scene mode. No, I want it here. There you go. Okay, bam, bam. I pressed too many buttons all at once. All right, cool. Well, that was it, right? I just put it in scene mode and you got a filter. I just got to remember how to do that. <laughs> Never fiddle with the camera during a live stream. Ah! Before the last pick for Zeta vibes. Yeah, it, it's very stylized, right? It's too much green in the skin generally. That, that Frazetta style has too much green and the skin, it, it can look unhealthy, but it's very, very good stylized, you know, for what, especially for like fantasy, like he was doing. For me, it's just too much green in it, right? There's already still a lot of green in this model, right? So when you're looking at it, sitting in front of it here, there's still a lot of green here. So we still have that, that tone that we want going very well. I like it, like it. Now, the question here is always, do we, do we start our next layers with the brush? And, and my general consensus is probably yes. I don't know that I want to do any more with the airbrush. You start getting an airbrush look if you go beyond where we're at right now. And then you got to clean all that up, which I don't really feel like doing. 
question mark. So I think we probably will start sketching in our, our skin tones again over this. I don't know, it looks really good right now. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 there you go, Inner Excellence. Yeah, I know they make something that I've seen, like a, a screw-on uh, lens filter for the top of this. I know that they make a sepia tone one. But I could probably get like a red one or something. Gel filters, that's it, yeah. For stage lights. I'm calling it a day. Yeah. We've already done four hours. I just, my goal today was to get to this stage so that everybody could see what we were doing uh, with the underpainting, right? This was the goal. We, well, actually, we did more than what my goal was. When I started paint, when I started saying we'd work on her today, I had no idea how far we get. We got a lot further than I thought. But once we started pushing into the realm of, uh, of having the, uh, the underpainting done, I knew we could push to get the flesh tones on. But she looks really good, right? This is going to be our our main scene, torso front on, head off to our right, right? She's already looking really good, right? We've maintained all of our shadow. We've got everything that we did up underneath, uh, bringing shadow from the neck down. We've got the reds punching through, the greens punching through. Let's just zoom in here, right? So our greens, right? And believe it or not, you've got your dark greens and your mid and your bright greens too. And then of course that pale yellow, and then back into our greens, our purple down there, a little bit of red. Lots of flush red in the, the uh, uh, sternum area there, right? Here, here, right? The neck, right? Underneath the cheek, right? This side much darker. We maintain that pretty well. Yep, yep, yep. Looks good. And you can see how if you if you dig in real close, you can see some of my loose texturing with the brush. But you notice how much of it went away. We still get just a little bit of texture for the skin, which is nice. But you remember how rough that was, right? And that filter layer also cleans all that up, right? But gives you that randomness that skin needs. It doesn't want to be like if you paint the cheek in an ellipse, you don't want it to be an ellipse. You want it to be a weird shape. So I paint like kind of a funnel shape. And then when we filter over the top of it, we get a really good kind of, I don't want to say splotchy because that makes it seem unhealthy, but it's, it is. It's like cloudy colors on skin, right? So none of it looks like straight painted shapes. That's why I use that very loose technique when I'm sketching the underpainted colors in there, right? And bingo. But you have all those colors. So you were saying like the Frazetta, right? I feel like I still have a good amount of that here. We've got that kind of yellow pushing through on the skin tone. Still got a good amount of greens, purples, and reds. All works very well. We need to cut in all of the rest of this. We need to get rid of the overspray because it's throwing a lot of the color off. Just that faint overspray, even though it's super thin, will draw the eye and make the, uh, the colors not as defined when we paint this way. But I did a pretty good job of not getting too much overspray in places. So there you go. I hope you have enjoyed today's uh, impromptu lesson on underpainting for flesh. I think we got a, a really, really good result out of it. Again, you can only do this with Procrural paints. No other paints work. <laughs> DJ Berkeley, I'm glad you stumbled onto our world too. Lots of fun. Somebody's going to be like, that guy's a liar. He said only his paints do this magic stuff. That's true. It's true. They have unicorn pixie dust in them. Jen makes sure. She sprinkles a little in every bottle. <laughs> but definitely do. If you've been lurking in the background, definitely do give us a shot at becoming your hobby supplier. Uh, check us out. Exclamation point store over at monumenthobbies.com. And uh, check out all the Pearl Curl paints and brushes and all the stuff we showed you on the stream today. Keeps us going. Allows us to do what we do here for free. 
Thanks for hanging out with us on a Sunday, and I will be back on Tuesday at 2 p.m. where we'll start painting our Necron again. <laughs> Although I'm sure everybody's going to want me to paint more Wonder Woman now, but we've still got a Necron to finish, so we will uh, maybe keep pounding away on him. So uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Sunday, assuming that it is still Sunday where you're at. Some of you, I know it's already moving into Monday. Have a great start to your week, and we will see you back here on Tuesday. Thanks so much, gang. Love your faces. I'm out of here.